this project actually starts at a friend's shop. I wanted to do some Lichtenberg and epoxy boards, but I don't have, and I don't want to have, a Lichtenberg setup, which obviously is a bit of a problem. So I went over to my buddy Adam Modig Woodworking, Woodworking's shop, and he was kind enough to collab with me on this project and do the burning for me. And, you know, of course, let the doggos play together. Anyway, if you're not familiar with Lichtenberg figures, they're created by using electricity to burn random patterns into wood. As we know, wood is normally an insulator and not a conductor of electricity. So the first step is brushing, brushing on an electrolyte solution onto the wood to give the electricity a path it can take. Then the electricity is adding using two probes. But one of the problems is standard 110 volt house electricity like we have here in the United States is pretty averse to resistance. It basically looks at that weak solution on the wood and goes, you know, that looks like a really hard trip to get over to that probe. It's gonna be a lot of work. I think I'll just stay cozy in this wire here. So we need something more adventurous, something more willing to jump between the sparse stepping stones across the river, so to speak. We need higher voltage. Adam uses a neon sign power supply that steps the voltage from 110 to 7,000 volts. Higher voltages are restless and eager to go new places and make connections, so it's just what we need for this technique. The trouble is, that's exactly what makes it so dangerous. Every few months, a new article pops up about a garage hobbyist that died using his homemade setup. Well, why? How? Well... Those high voltages required to make electricity form a circuit through weak solution on wood behave differently than the lower voltages most of us are used to. At high voltage, even air becomes a conductor of electricity. That's not actually news to anyone on Earth, though, which is everyone, because that's how lightning works, and that's how accidents happen. Not touching the work isn't enough to stay safe. You can't get so close that the journey to your body is easier than the path across the wood. And there's no warning shots. The first person to find out that you made a mistake will be the next person to visit your shop, not you. If you're interested in an alternate technique for producing Lichtenberg figures, I'm experimenting with some safe techniques that's totally different. So consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell if you want to catch that when it comes out. Otherwise, do what I do and find someone that's comfortable and experienced with Lichtenberg figures that maybe doesn't have any dependence. After finishing up at Adam's shop, I brought the boards home and got the woodwork and epoxy part of this project. First up is cutting the walnut board in half so it can become two charcuterie boards. After marking what I feel is center, I rip it down at the bandsaw. The cut edge is a bit rough, so I go ahead and joint it, but since this is going in a mold next, the jointing could be skipped. The poplar board, I wanted to give some more creative shapes, mainly to exercise that part of my creativity because I feel like I'm really bad at it, so I just use a pencil and sketch out a profile that I think is going to look alright, uh, then I separate the boards with the jigsaw. I don't bother cutting the exact profile yet because I know the epoxy is going to make a mess of things and require some trimming up afterwards and leaving extra just gives me extra to play with. The popular boards have some cracks as well as the figures to be filled with epoxy, but they don't need a full form or I'm just lazy. So I use some parchment paper under the cracks so the epoxy won't try to bond to the adhesive side of the tape. That would happen if I just stuck tape under the bottom. That actually worked well, but I screwed up thinking the tape was gonna hold on the end grain of the boards. I should have dammed up the ends of the cracks with hot glue instead, but we'll get to that later. I'm using total boat thick set epoxy for these. Two to one probably would work fine because it's not very deep in these boards, but I like how the thick set releases air bubbles well on its own, kind of like me in the pool, and settles into the cracks easier because it's thinner. So I mix up a little more than I expect to need and add some pigment for each board. Then the fun is always epoxy pour over.
walnut boards are a bit different though. They're going to be half epoxy, so they do need a full form built. I did some experimenting in a previous video and found out that marker board actually works fine as a mold, so I break it down to have a bottom slightly larger than the finished boards I want, and some thin strips to be sides, and then those all get cut to fit the base. And to keep with the idea of these being quick and, quick and cheap, like me, I assemble it with tape and then silicone the corners to make it watertight. Then the boards get clamped into the mold in a feeble attempt to keep them from floating. Reality is that would take a couple more clamps, but now I know that. For details on build building larger molds, check out my epoxy coffee table build. Then I can get up to mixing up a much larger batch of Total Boat Thick Set for these bigger pours separating them out and adding pigment. This is a lesson in why it's important to test your pigments. Cause this beautiful deep red with magenta tones, I'm not great with color, that's going into this walnut. Well, I won't ruin the surprise. Just wait till you see what it looks like after it dries and is out of the mold. But if you're keeping count at home, I've got another walnut board to do. This time I mix in some pistachio colored pigment that my wife picked out and it actually turned out to be my favorite even though I would have never thought to pick this color for a charcuterie board, and I'm definitely not saying that for brownie points with my wife. But anyway, remember those poplar boards? Well, they did have some embarrassing leakage because of that tape problem on the end grain, so once it cured, I made some hot glue dams, like I talked about earlier, on the ends, and then topped them off with a bit more epoxy. After a few days, the epoxy was cured and everything could be demolded. I was really pleased with how the parchment paper and tape worked on the poplar boards. It peeled right off. Then I started sending boards to the planer to remove the excess epoxy and flatten them, but I didn't realize how shallow some of the Lichtenberg figures were. So even taking light passes, I accidentally went from being almost down to the figures to inadvertently removing almost all of one side of a board. So at that point, I started taking even lighter passes and focused more on planing than the camera. And remember that beautiful red and walnut board? Well, I don't think this is red. Anyway. After the boards are flat on both sides, I can get to squaring them up. At least the walnut boards, the poplar boards, the idea is to not be close to square. The epoxy edge was against the mold wall and is really straight, so I reference it as the first cut at the table saw and then take a spring pass on the epoxy side just to clean it up. With the long side straight and parallel, the miter saw makes quick work of squaring the ends. And the last finishing touch on the walnut boards is using a router to put a chamfer on the underside of the boards. It's just a detail I like and makes it easier to pick them up in lieu of having handles. But if you don't have a trim router, a hand plane, or a sander, a router table will also work in a pinch to do that chamfer. Before I get to sanding, I need to get the poplar boards ready too. I finalize the shape I think I want them to be. I often see people cutting these out with jigsaws and coping saws and everything, so I thought I'd show instead that a bandsaw will also work even if you only have a resaw blade. It just takes a little finagling around the corners and some relief cuts. Whichever saw I use though always tends to leave a rough cut, but my oscillating sander makes quick work of smoothing them out and is a lot faster than hand sanding. A chamfer didn't feel right on these boards since they're so curvy, so I opted to break the edges on both sides with a round over bit instead. And once again, if you don't have sandpaper, files, or a hand router, a router table can also work. And finally, the part I've really been looking forward to, sanding these through the grits, which actually is kind of fun with my new Merca setup. It takes all the crappy parts out of sanding. It goes faster, barely vibrates, is practically dustless, and is a lot quieter. I'm only wearing earmuffs, so I don't have to turn up my earbuds as loud. And finally, for what seems to be everyone's favorite part, at least on par with pouring epoxy, the finishing. To make sure these are safe for food contact, I'm coating them with General Finish's salad bowl finish, which is non-toxic when cured. 
for a full shakedown on food safety with cutting boards and epoxy and all that, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell so YouTube actually tells you when I release that video next week, which I'm working on diving deep into that. Also, these boards are for sale until they're sold, so check the description for information on that if you're interested. And with my little Ortor laser, it's super easy to personalize these boards in just a few minutes, and I really look forward to playing with this laser more. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something, or inspired, or at least entertained. And until next time, make time to make something.